Welcome to 3D From Nothing, powered by Metal Might, the show where you learn all about 3D printing and additive technology. I'm your host, Tom Jendik. Metal Might is a full-service machine shop that specializes in 5 and 6 axis CNC machining, CNC grinding, and wire EDM, and 3D printing. We have a 50-plus year history, started by my father, Michael Jendik III. I took over as CEO in 2009, and I'm continuing the manufacturing technology today as a third-generation owner. In this program, you'll learn what kinds of printers are out there, what kind of material you can use, who's using these printers, what kinds of things you should be looking at printing, as well as hearing from experts in the field through interviews that we'll be conducting. And as always, you can go to our website, 3dfromnothing.com. You'll find some free giveaways and learn all about what we're doing. See the links in the show for everything we're talking about. And you'll learn about where our name comes from, which was my father, who said someday we'll make parts out of nothing. And that's just what we're doing today with 3D printing and additive technology. Today, we have a special guest for you, Niels Neimeyer from DMG Mori Additive Team. Niels is the manager of the sales and service of DMG Mori Additive. It turns out in 2017, I got a chance to go to Fronten, Germany with my wife to see the DMG Mori CTX machine that we had just purchased. At that show, they had a uh, black tarp covering up some special new technology that they were releasing all about the additive. Niels and I may have met one another at the show. We were just discussing it beforehand. So Niels, welcome to our show. Hello, Tom. Thanks for having me on the show today. Thanks for inviting me. And yeah, I'm really excited to talk with you about additive, how it all started at DMG Mori, about hybrid additive machines, as well as laser powder bed machines. Absolutely. I think uh, as we were discussing beforehand, the exciting thing, DMG Mori has been a big part of Metal Might since uh, our inception. Uh, I believe we've had about 30 machining centers through the years and I've just absolutely loved the product and been a big uh, fan of everything they've put out. The additive side has been a little bit uh, secretive. Even people who frequently use DMG Mori on the subtractive side are not even aware that there's an entire additive team and an additive department at DMG Mori. I know you were saying that as you've been on board, how many years now have you been with the additive side? Yeah, really, I joined the additive side in 2017, right around the time that the powder bed product was brought into the company. And then previously, I had worked with the DMG Mori already 10 years ago on also on hybrid machines. But at that time, it was uh, hybrid machines, machining and grinding. Yeah. So at that time, we were more talking about uh, different ways to remove metal instead of building it up and removing it at the same time. Yeah. So it seems that you've made your career around bundling two, two options in one box, whether it be the grinding or the additive. It seems like I like the challenge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's exciting. And we have talked on this show about many different kinds of printing already. We've talked to a couple other specialists, but I have not talked to anybody that has been able to successfully put additive and subtract in the same package. And so that's something I know uh, DMG is doing uh, very well. Can you talk a little bit about the advantages and why somebody would want that? Yeah, and I really think that DMG Mori were like the pioneers in that field to commercialize that machine concept. So the way the way it occurred, the way it started is that DMG Mori previously, they um, introduced laser applications into machining centers. And then around 2012, 13, right around that time when additive became more interesting in the industry, it was almost natural to go from laser machining to laser deposition. Yeah, And it was a, a bold decision to include laser deposition welding in machining centers. And the vision at the time was, uh, was clearly that towards larger envelopes, if you have the capability to build them up in a larger machine envelope and machine them at the same time. So basically the capability to build up parts and provide finished machine surfaces and properties. That was the, the vision the company followed in the beginning. And where this technology developed to today is simply amazing. Yeah, um, you can see how you've, uh, we, we were able to bring up your brochure here that you sent me ahead of time. Thank you for doing that. We can see uh, for, the, for those viewing on the visual part of this uh, podcast, you've taken multiple technologies and, and combined it into 
uh, a, a package deal, right? So you, you not only have the laser, you were saying that you have, uh, is it electron beam technology as well as powder bed? We focus mostly on laser together with metal powder. And that works so well because both the laser is very flexible and the powder is uh, flexible to apply as well. Okay. So in fact, what you can basically utilize the, the laser additive tool, you can utilize it in a similar way like a machining tool. Okay. And we can clamp a laser tool or we can clamp the additive tool in the machine spindle in the same way that we would normally clamp a, a turning tool or a milling tool. And so oh. you get a very versatile uh, platform. Now talk to me about the the health risk, if you will. We just, we had a, we started with a selective laser sintering machine here at Metal Might, and it was a powder bed machine. And when we had the doors open and that powdered metal was being handled, either being cleaned out or moved, we had to wear sort of a hazmat suit and a respirator to make sure that none of it was ingested. Now, if you've got this in a, as you're talking about a tool change, you literally, you bring your laser head down as you would a shell mill cutter or some other tool. How is that environment kept confined? Yeah, Tom, that's a really good question. I think a lot of people in the industry share that same question. And on the hybrid machines, the advantage here is really the powder is a little bit larger than what you would see on your selective laser melting machine. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit larger and therefore it falls quicker to the ground. So it typically doesn't float in the air, but that by itself is not, that's not a safety uh, precaution enough. So we really care for not exposing the operator to the material at all. So if you picture your standard five axis machining center, that's basically what we use as a base machine. And after you have finished a deposition, the door remains locked for a certain period, say 30 mm. seconds, 60 seconds. And we have additional, we have an additional exhaust system on the machine that is cleaning the entire inside of the air. So all welding gases, all powder particles that still might float around, they get cleaned out of the air. And then since you're using a machining center, you can simply use the coolant to clean the, the inside of the machine. Wow. That's really I didn't think about that because we never, we don't have coolant in our laser bed, so there's no liquid to get the powder out of the air. Exactly. And that's one of the very convenient advantages of the hybrid machine. After you're finished building the part, you use your coolant to spray down uh, the part, you spray down the powder out of the uh, corners of the machine, and the powder falls into the chip conveyor and is then being uh, disposed the same way metal chips. I mentioned that I started my DMG Mori journey with grinding applications. Right. Turns out the grinding chips are fairly similar to the particles that we use for the additive side. Right. So we, we apply a special a grinding package on the machine and yeah, that makes it secure and protected. That makes sense. That's good to know. Cause like I said, I wondered how that was handled and obviously DMG Morris thought through that. So you, your hybrid machine is really taking these two technologies and bringing it together. So you're getting two machines in one package. Can you talk to us about who would really see the most benefit out of this? What, what kinds of industry, what kinds of products really see an advantage having two in one? Yeah, we really see interest from all industries, but then specifically some industries stand out, right? And that can be aerospace, medical, automotive, certainly the energy industry between oil and gas applications and turbine applications. And, and we get a lot of repair cases. Think about mold and dye, for example. Your molds, your, for example, aluminum die casting, the molds and the dyes, they, they wear out over time. Since you can take the dye, clamp it inside of the machining center, you can repair it in one setup. You can simply machine away the wear. You can rebuild it using uh, laser deposition welding. And then in the end, you give it a surface finish. So you have a die that functions as, as good as a new die, essentially, all within wow. one setup. Yeah. So that brings up a good point now in repair. So what we've seen traditional repair, a die company would send it out to a weld shop and they would weld up some material, come back to a machine shop to machine it back down to size. 
and they try to use what they would just call a hard weld or some sort of harder material. You could get into bimetal products, right? You could get into something even harder than the original substance. Or have you experimented with that? Have you looked at that? Yeah, you bring up an excellent point. We started having dual hoppers on the machine. So you have essentially two materials in the machine and you can load either one or the other material and you can even blend those. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you can imagine that opens up a wider range of applications. Um, oh, yeah. And particularly you're right in saying that you would normally repair manually. Right. Now, when you weld with a five axis CNC controlled machine, that process is much more repeatable, is much more reliable. And yeah, that, that opens, that actually improves the quality of those repaired parts quite a bit. Yeah, I believe I saw in the literature here, you're as accurate as, was it five microns when you're using the laser tip? Yeah, the repeatability of the laser tool is as accurate as the as a machining tool. Mm -hmm. And then uh, certainly your surface is a little bit uh, wavy because you have particles in a range of 50 to 150 micrometers. Nevertheless, since we can use machining, we actually, the, the finished surfaces are as accurate as machine surfaces. Yeah. So like you say, you can build up, uh, I found the page here talking about a little bit, it says 70% shorter material development cycle. Again, when you think about traditionally, even five, 10 years ago, hard welding something manually, you're just blobbing on some material. Then you're coming back, spending a lot of time removing a lot of this hard weld that you didn't need. With this machine, you can you could go right into the points that matter. And then if it's it needs to be even tighter, you can actually even grind finish if you needed to. Not in this machine, but in another machine. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Very yeah. interesting. So I noticed there's a product family. Can you talk a little bit about the product family that DMG Mori has? Yeah, we've been talking about the, the hybrid machines now, and that was the technology we started the additive journey with. And then a couple of years ago, 2017, when you were in front, and yeah. <laughs> that's when Deem Jimori added the uh, powder bed system. So that's then the second part of the family. And those powder bed machines are uh, similar to what you would know, where you coat a layer of metal and a laser is then melting the powder. So those are essentially the two technologies and they, they complement each other very well. Uh, depending on what application you have, you would either go on the larger hybrid machine or on the more complex, more uh, filigree powder bed machine. Okay. And, and what is the largest envelope of the powder bed machine? The largest thing you can print? At the moment, we are looking at about a, a cubic foot, uh, oh. so 300 by 300 millimeters, and then uh, 300 millimeter in Z. That Z height can be extended uh, a little bit, but that is currently the envelope size focusing on. I have to detour for one second as we're talking about that front and show in 2017 that we may have uh, been there together. And that was unveiled. There was the, the giant uh, sign on the side of the factory that you and I talked about walking up, unveiling it. I don't understand. And I do have a, a sort of a bone to pick with upper management in front. And it, if you're working in a factory and there's all this glass in this factory, looking out at snow-capped mountains and it looked to me about 50% of the employees rode their bicycle to work that day. And a few of them, I think, were snowboarding during their break at the factory. I'm 25 miles north of Detroit. And I have to say, I'm a little bit jealous of the atmosphere that uh, they had in, in Bavaria. And it would be hard to get anything done inside the factory if you're looking at that landscape. Yeah, they, or you have to uh, be really focused in your work time and then finish on time and hit the slopes. <laughs> that's, that's true. That's true. Maybe, maybe it's because they have a good mix of, of exercise that, that they get a lot done inside the factory. But yeah, that's exciting that it was launched uh, when I was there. And let's say you and I were there together. So we have the roughly 300 millimeter cubed or one foot cubed powder laser powder machine and then you had a series of I might have to go back to the beginning here there was maybe that's it right there there was a series of looks like four of the laser tech machines the hybrids right yeah Can we talk um, about those envelopes those sizes that we could get 
Yeah, and that's when it's getting really big. The philosophy is a little bit that the very complex and, and small and intricate parts, your powder bat machine is perfect for that. And then for the larger parts, we use the hybrid machines. So we are just right now, as we speak, running off the first of its kind, largest hybrid additive manufacturing machine in the world. So that is the largest machine on the West Coast it has a in-between spindles of four meters, four, four meters. meters. And it, there is an option for six meters. That's oh. as big as we can go. The diameter on that one is about 60, 60 inches in, in diameter. So you see the envelope can go really big. Yeah. And is that machine capable of titanium as we saw on the, uh, there are, there are some, yeah, there are some applications that we can run in titanium that certainly entails a, a safety package right, because right. of the nature Fire. of titanium. Yeah. It really wants to grab oxygen and <laughs> blow right, up in right. the air. Yeah. But that that is a possibility as well. Okay. What are the primary materials? Is it the, the tool steels and the stainless steel then? Or? Uh, yeah, tool steels with lower carbon contents, stainless steels go very well. And then it becomes really interesting with materials like Inconel, a cobalt chrome, because those are hard to machine. And here with, with the hybrid approach, we are building near net shape. So we only need to machine a, a minimum. D Besides inconels or cobalt chrome, we can also do copper alloys. We can do, yeah, uh, stellite. And those are just a few. Our rule of thumb is essentially anything that is weldable. Any okay. metal that is weldable, we are, we are able to build up. Okay. Yeah, I know the historically the aluminum and titanium have the uh, risk, the, the hazardous risk. You have to have fire extinguishing abilities and, and things like that available. So those are more difficult, but we're seeing a huge influx in the aerospace and space now, which apparently is its own division. Yeah. Space really likes Inconel with the rocket engines and, and they also like copper. We've seen a lot of copper products. And so it, it appears that when you talk about things like a blade, as you were talking mm -hmm. about something that you subtractively is very difficult and time consuming to machine from a solid billet, I, I assume that's where you would really see the advantage of your machine to just build only what you need and maybe finish a little bit with the, with the mill. Exactly. Yeah, that's it. And now I throw in material combinations where you can build Inconel on a copper sleeve, on a copper core, oh. and suddenly you have bimetallic parts, a solid in one piece, finished machined within, I want to say, hours instead of weeks or months. Yeah, wow. so there are, there are applications where you can seriously disrupt the, the process chain, the supply chain, and that's, yeah, it's mind blowing. That's fantastic. Now, uh, talk to us a little bit about where are these products at? If somebody just wanted to go see something, I know with COVID, it's always hard to go somewhere. We're not having IMTS shows and things like we used to. Hopefully soon we get back yeah. to getting together and doing that. But w number one, on the web, where can we go to see it? And then number two, if there's someone was very serious, you talked about the West Coast and, and I know Chicago. Let's, where, where, can, where are these things at? Yeah, you, your first information you can obtain from dmgmori.com okay. and uh, the additive manufacturing solutions. It's one division, it's one uh, product, one solution you, you find information online. But then it becomes really interesting when you get to see it physically and when right. you can maybe touch parts. So we are located in Chicago as a center of excellence for additive manufacturing. Okay. And we have the entire array from the powder bed machines to the hybrid machines. We have them in Chicago. We have a dedicated staff that is supporting applications and service and development of, yeah, of really of customer applications. If Tom, if you are interested and if you have an application in mind, then I would uh, essentially invite you to Chicago. Our engineers look at the solid models together with you and we can go all the way to proving it out on the machine and you can witness the project. You can witness the process on a machine in Chicago. Oh, wow. Um, so even with COVID, you're finding ways to safely bring people in, uh, show them the product, the touch and feel the machine, like you say. 
Yeah, we have uh, we have fairly uh, strict COVID guidelines. We are in a, a remote uh, work setting where we have essential work in the office, and we can bring customers in with some precautions that are yeah fairly similar to what CDC is is publishing. What we have seen over the last year, some customers uh, take advantage of that. A lot of customers they might not be comfortable with traveling, or companies are not comfortable with sending their employees. So. Right. Over the last year, we have done a lot of virtual shows. We can set up a virtual demonstration where we have our experts on a call, where we demonstrate the machine in the showroom. And that is actually, it's become a very dynamic and interactive exchange. And I, I think we will see more of that in the future, even when we go back to hosting customers in the showroom. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know I, for one, over the last... 12 to 14 months have been on more Zoom calls as you and I are on right now than, than I've ever been in my life. But you're right. I think not only have we been on the Zoom calls, I think we've found better ways to use it and to interact. And as we were just doing, you could share a screen while talking to somebody, which is harder to do if you're standing face to face, unless you're carrying an iPad or something, you can, you can show them the machine. So that's very interesting. If our good friend, Mr. Elon Musk wanted to come in with a group of guys and get a dozen of these things on his floor to start making bimetal products, a copper and ink and all at the same time, uh, he can certainly do that. He can make an arrangement with you and, and he can uh, come on and, and make that happen. Absolutely. We have we have meetings, meeting rooms for him. We have sodas that we cater <laughs> and we have the machines to present. So yeah, he is welcome to visit us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's good to know. Because like I say, it's, I think for DMG Mori specifically, such a fantastic name. I, I actually uh, pretty spoiled. I got a chance to go to Fronten and then a year later, I got a chance to go to Japan. So I got to see uh, many of the factories in both, both countries. I think they've made an excellent name for themselves. All the companies really, Deco, Maho, Gildemeister, Morisiki, now under one name. I'm really excited about the package that they have for all the machining centers. And the additive I feel is, again, as you said, when somebody has such a strong name, we, we actually talked uh, ahead of time. It's very similar to Mercedes Benz or uh, BMW or Cadillac now having fully electric vehicles. Uh, there a few, all of them do, I believe, have electric vehicles. Even Porsche has an electric vehicle. And yet Tesla gets all the all the media and the marketing because they were the first to market. Everyone thinks of Tesla. And then the, all these other car manufacturers are saying, we actually have fully electric vehicles too. I think DMG Mori has is, is got a little bit of that. They have a little bit of catch up to do to show people. But I think what we've seen throughout history where they very quickly become number one, it sounds like uh, DMG Mori has taken their time they're doing it right. They've got a good product, uh, a combination. A question I, I just thought of, is anyone else on market that you have a combination machine of, of doing both additive and subtractive together? Yeah. First of all, yeah. Thanks for giving a compliment <laughs> to us <laughs> and for noting the dedications in, in the factories and, and the entire team. It really takes a lot of dedication oh, yeah. uh, to come up with such a technology. Uh, yeah. There there is there is other suppliers in the market in both fields for the powder beds as well as for the hybrids okay. and one thing i really love about the additive industry is that it is almost like a movement it's a it's an evolution of a new technology and it actually even though it's a competitive field and the competition is is growing it's like a friendly competition Okay. Because every supplier is fighting hand in hand, not only for their own for their own contracts, but actually to develop the industry, right? And to make additive manufacturing available in a broad sense to many customers. Okay. And so I, I think that on the on the hybrid side, TMG Mori was really the driver of commercializing this. And mm. they were like the first ones in the market. And now you see other companies, of course, other competitors on, on the machining side that come up with solutions as well. And, and that's great. We need competition and we need, as an industry, we need to move forward and advance this. And I think on the powder bed side, the setting is a little bit different. That technology is around for 20, 30 years. And our technology 
goes back to one of the pioneers in the field, Dr. Fockele, but he certainly was not the only pioneer. And there were some of the bigger companies that basically developed and, and drove, grew that market. So I think we can be really grateful for all the initial development uh, and market development that has been done there. And now it's it's interesting. The suppliers are diversifying. And as a customer, you will, yeah, you will have to uh, choose what advantages you are looking for, who will be your partner by your side to, to make the change into like the new paradigm of manufacturing. That's, that is really exciting. We, we talked about in one of the last shows about how additive is a fairly new on the market. And now we're finally seeing a new breed of engineers and designers who are designing using this new technology, because sometimes the old parts didn't lend themselves to be made through additive as well. And now that they understand it, it's becoming full circle where they can design it to be a good thing to print from. And as you said, partnering with this bimetal concept and this hybrid concept, bringing things together. I guess one last comment, and we'll wrap up this segment. You had mentioned two hoppers for a bimetal product. Is there a way to do three or four? Have you looked at multiples like that or... Absolutely. You can use multiple materials. And then the question is the dual powder hopper, you can automate it automatically go back and forth between the two. Using that hopper, you can change materials within a few minutes. With that configuration, you can already use multiple materials. If you are really looking for changing three or four different materials automatically, then there there is a possibility for also including more than dual powder hoppers on the machine. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I don't know an application where you would want that, but I guess just because you mentioned two, I wondered, are we limited to two or could we uh, could we do four? The, the customer we mentioned earlier, Mr. Musk, I think he would probably be the guy that would want four or six different <laughs> options. Try. Yeah. Push to possible. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Well, as we wrap up this segment, then, is there any closing thoughts you want to talk about of the product or how to contact you, anything like that? Yeah, I can really only say anybody who is interested in additive manufacturing, it is an interesting journey. Started today, the industry has come a very long way. So we are far beyond prototyping today. We are mm. already in production. So if you're curious, if you're interested, reach out to us and we are happy to go that journey together with you. I think, Tom, you might be sharing my contact information. So mm -hmm. everybody is welcome to reach out to me or simply through dmgmori.com. And we will be happy to get in touch with you. Our engineers can help with vetting applications. And yeah, let's, let's begin Excellent. this journey together. And if they're lucky enough like me, they can meet you in Fronten and uh, you can show them uh, the next uh, the next new reveal. <laughs> oh, so. Oh. Hopefully when the mountains are snowy again next year, that's an option. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, very good. So this last segment, I'd like you to join me on, Niels. We talk about current events. When I was growing up in middle school, the teacher used to ask about current events. And so we we browsed the, today, we browsed the internet. Uh, it used to, back then it was newspapers. And we looked through the internet and we found a couple events that involved additive technology. And uh, I found them interesting in, in light of this. Uh, and a couple of them are very relevant to the conversation you and I just had. So again, the links are in the show notes if you want to read the articles yourself. Both of these happen to come from 3dprint.com. Today, I found NASA's Perseverance rover touched down on the Mars Jezero crater on February 18th, so just a month ago. Since then, Mission Control has made lots of progress, including capturing the planet's sounds, driving on the, the rocky craters, the red terrain for the first time, transmitting over 7,000 images. That's just amazing, something driving around on Mars, sending back images for us to look at. And as it relates to our conversation, in order to develop this, the 3D printers were used by NASA in, in conjunction with the Jet Propulsion Lab, JPL in California, to achieve the uh, lightest weight, the JPL team turned to the metal AM service provider of Carpenter Additive to print the instrument's two-piece titanium shell, the mounting frame, and the two support struts. We're now seeing uh, not only on, in our world, but on, on another world and Mars, we've got uh, additive technology making it possible for, for printing something lighter and stronger than maybe Subtractive could have provided. So I find that fascinating. Yeah. I think that's excellent. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I, I don't know about you, but I really love the, the book and the movie of The Martian. <laughs> <laughs> I do, I the, do. The movie for the visuals and seeing those live images today is just amazing. It's, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah, I keep and, waiting um, for Matt Damon to show up waving or something, but yeah, <laughs> the movies. yeah no, I, it, it is, it's amazing to think of it. And we actually had a chance. Unfortunately, I can't talk about it too much so with the customer, who, who the customer was, but we got a chance. They're actually making a human landing vehicle and they're looking to do some additive parts on that. So we were just, uh, just in some meetings this week here at Metal Might having that conversation. That was pretty exciting to think that there'll be a human team headed there sometime in the near future. And, and those uh, vehicles have to get up there as well. So the, the rockets that are going up, they are also utilizing additively uh, printed parts. If you look at the entire ecosystem and the the supply chain. It's incredible how, at how many points additive can support and push the, the big visions of, of humanity. And that leads us perfectly to the second article I found also on 3D print. We're talking about materials and a jet propulsion. So NASA has successfully used a bimetal additive using laser powder bed fusion. So this is exactly uh, what you talked about today. They made a, it looks like a copper alloy. They call it GRCOP-84 copper alloy for their liquid rocket combustion engine. And they also used AM electron beam freeform in Inconel 625. So two of the very products you were talking about today, bimetal in order to make one of the rockets that they're using to, to test. So again, something wasn't possible a few years ago. Now through the advances of additive, through experimenting and these new frontiers we're covering by just, hey, let's try it. Let's add two hoppers. Let's put copper and Inconel on the same thing. We're seeing the ability to reach another planet or several planets for that matter. Yeah. That's pretty exciting. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. So yeah, that concludes my my two finds for today. They happen to both uh, be very relevant to our conversation as well as using this additive world. Niels, I really appreciate you joining us. Thank you so much for taking the time. I know you're a busy guy and appreciate you educating us. And, and we just look forward to what else you're bringing to the market and hopefully getting to join you in Fronten again soon. Yeah, absolutely. No, thanks, Tom. And I'm really fo looking forward to meeting you in person and in Fronten or Chicago or anywhere else. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks for having me today and the best of luck with, with your 3D printing. <laughs> Thank you so much. We, 